many have expressed their pleasure and honor in being here, and I'm no exception there. Um, when I sent the title of this talk to uh, to Zui and Zhang Bo, I um, I explicitly wanted to pay homage to uh, Sidney Coleman and his lectures, which uh, deeply influenced me as a graduate student and beyond, though I cannot claim to have understood them, and perhaps there are nuggets there that I still uh, don't understand. Um, and so, But I was very glad to see that several speakers uh, talked about Coleman and his influence on physics. And, and in my case, it was really uh, thinking about nucleation, bubble nucleation, that uh, and I was familiar with Jim Langer's work and so on and so, so that sort of led me to Coleman's uh, thinking about it in quantum field theory. So um, this is a bit of a misuse of uh, his language, um, but uh, it may still be, be relevant in this context that I'm going to talk about. Uh, so what I'm really going to talk about today is really is, is terra incognita, um, uh, and um, it's 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 um, it's it's a it's it's about physics that's deeply profound and deeply baffling still uh, in QCD that we don't fully understand, um, and this kind of landscape that I've drawn here with strong interactions and resolution and Q squared and parton densities or in energy um, kind of. Uh, illustrates that. So at very large Q squareds and very high resolutions, we of course have asymptotic freedom um, and all its riches. And down here, um, of course, we have you know, lattice QCD, uh, which is uh, very powerful, as you've heard. And then there are all these effective field theories uh, that also allows you to sort of go further. Uh, but then you, you start thinking about this regime here, when you sort of start going down Q squared, we are still at weak coupling perhaps, and then you're going higher in energy. And then you're entering this regime of really strongly correlated quark gluon dynamics. And so from a condensed matter perspective of QCD, this is perhaps the most interesting regime because these are this is the physics of one body distributions, and you want to understand how many body correlations emerge and whether there are non-trivial say quantum phase transitions or phenomena that occur in this regime here. And then when you go even further, you're getting to very high parton densities. Uh, and so what is the physics of that regime? You're in a very strong uh, regime, very strong field strengths. Now do you understand that? And what I'm going to argue to you is that at sufficiently small x, uh, there's a regime that emerges. It's emergent physics where the physics is weak coupling, and which gives you a window into understanding the truly sort of um, uh, baffling uh, physics of Pomerons and Regions that uh, have sort of predated QCD and actually motivated a lot of uh, thinking about string theory, as we heard from Gabriele's uh, talk um, a couple of days ago. Uh, so this is kind of, uh, to just situate my talk, uh, this is kind of the physics that, that I'm going to be talking about. Uh, so so uh, I, I apologize to those of you who have heard, seen some of these slides before, but uh, so this is, uh, so what I'm going to be talking about is the, um, essentially what, what leads to the physics of Pomerons in QCD. Uh, and the Pomeron is, is understood to be, uh, uh, at least uh, qualitatively, uh, as being, it's a T-channel exchange in high energy scattering at very large S and small T's. Um, and uh, s such effective descriptions uh, enable us to understand the total cross-section across three orders of magnitude. Um, and these can be understood in terms of Pomeron region trajectories. And they also explain differential cross-sections as a function of momentum transfer across several orders of magnitude and energies. Uh, and so... Um, Uh, yes, it's a log squared S line, yes. Um, so in, in, uh, so the Pomeron, uh, as I mentioned, is, can be thought of as a T-channel exchange uh, with vacuum quantum numbers. And in perturbative QCD, um, it's understood as a compound color singlet state of true dressed uh, radius gluons, which I will discuss shortly. Uh, and, and it has a partner, which is the Auteron, um, which was, 
uh, initially understood as being responsible for the difference between proton-proton and proton-antiproton cross-sections at very high energies, uh, which in perturbative QCD can again be thought of as a compound color singlet exchange of three radioized gluons. And recently there's been claims for the discovery of the Audron, but uh, it's somewhat controversial and, and I won't go into that here. Uh, so the, 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 the question that uh, begs an answer is, is the Palmer on a robust object in QCD? And um, <laughs> I made this joke before that that uh, perhaps the Palmeron is a true god particle because no one really knows what it is, but lots of people have ideas about what it is, and it's endlessly fascinating. Uh, but I'm a heretic there. Uh, but uh, so the, 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 you even, uh, I mean, so one of the complications is that if you uh, are start thinking in terms of just this as a, as a robust object, then uh, just considerations of unitarity and just more mundane things like diffractive dissociation tell you that you know you you it's not just Palmer on exchange, but you have to have multi Palmer on dynamics and exchanges. Uh, and so this is something that one needs to sort of think think about. And now, as my previous slide suggested, we think of Palmer on dynamics as being dominated by glue. And and uh, this is uh, sort of. Uh, uh, th this this is uh, becomes clear when we think about going to small x, um, and we look at the Hera data for parton distributions, and you see that it's really completely dominated by glue as you go to small x. So the valence distributions just drop out; they're described by sort of essentially rigid behavior, but the gluon distributions grow extremely rapidly, uh, and and you see this uh, very nicely. Uh, in the parton model, you have a very clean understanding of this plot in the parton model where you think about uh, these valence distributions which at low energies are dressed by soft glue, uh, which sort of fluctuate in or out of vacuum around these valence quarks, but then as you boost it to higher and higher energies, uh, you access higher and higher Fox states containing larger numbers of these gluons, and that sort of explains this very rapid growth of parton distributions. Um, so how do you think about the Palmeron and QCD? Um, and so the, the, um, the cele celebrated um, picture of that is the BF Gale Palmeron. And it's a sophisticated construction which describes 2 to n scattering. So here understood as the imaginary part of the 2 to 2 uh, amplitude at very high energies, so, so large s, small t. Um, and it's, it's kind of a remarkable object where, which is made up of its building blocks in so-called multi-radio kinematics uh, are these effective vertices, uh, which is here called the Lepata vertex. And, and that's a sum of all these uh, sort of two to three diagrams, which can be written uh, using the Jacobi identity as sort of a non-local vertex here. And the other building block is a regized gluon uh, which can be understood as summing up all sort of virtual corrections in multi-radio kinematics, which give you double logs, these pseudocode logs, which can then be resummed uh, in, in such a way where you replace the one over t propagators by one over t times this exponentiated form, um, where alpha contains the string tension, and this is the difference of rapidities within each rung of the ladder. And so with these building blocks, you can sort of construct this entire ladder of 2 to n scattering, um, where this um, string tension has been computed in perturbative QCD in these multi radio kinematics to two loop orders. So this is a nice uh, work by going back to the work of Fadin, where, where uh, you see that what appears as a beta function of QCD, um, the, the first term, as well as these two loop cusp anomalous dimensions and two loop wedge anomalous dimensions that uh, so George Sturman can tell you a lot about. And so the, the total cross-section is the imaginary part of this forward scattering amplitude. And with this BF scale construction, you find that this grows as a function of some number, which to leading log accuracy uh, has, this function, has this form here, which if you put in some numbers, you see that this is 
uh, this gives you 0.5. So it's a very rapid growth of the cross section, much faster than the data that I showed you. Um, now this RG equation, uh, which describes how you sort of evolve uh, from rung to rung in this construction, is the BF Gale Hamiltonian. Um, and this is a remarkable object. Um, it has uh, really fascinating mathematical properties such as holomorphic separability, can be generalized to an integrable model, and there's a large body of beautiful work in, in N equal to four SUSY. And I believe you'll be hearing more about this uh, later in the week by, from Grisha Korczemski and, and, and perhaps some others. Now, um, when you go to next to leading log uh, in, this, in this construction, uh, so, so this is then sort of going to higher order corrections in this Lepato vertex uh, that, that, I, that I was showing you here. Uh, and you can prove that there's regiofactorization at next to leading log accuracy. Uh, and that includes one loop corrections to this Lepato vertex that I showed you in the previous slide, uh, and two loop corrections to the regio trajectory. Okay, so that was the, um, the expression I showed you going back to Fadin. Um, and there's, um, as I mentioned, a tremendous amount of work done in looking at two to n amplitudes um, at, at high energies. So people have gone up to, in, in maximally helicity violating and next to maximally helicity violating amplitudes, people looked up to, to, uh, to, two to up to two to seven um, scatterings. Um, and uh, this really a rich body of work, so as we burn here is of course a great expert on this, and there's a really beautiful review if people want to know more about the state of the art by Vittorio Del Duca and Lance Dixon from, from um, earlier last year, some of this physics. Uh, and as I mentioned, there's, there's a lot of work also uh, at, at large toft coupling, um, sort of understanding uh, this kind of scattering in terms of uh, sort of minimal surfaces and and um, uh, so there's a duality between amplitudes and minimal area surfaces with light-like uh, polygon boundaries. Um, um, and and uh, in fact, I, I should sort of call out Vittorio Del Duca here because uh, it's through his work, his sort of his provider translation, to me at least, uh, so Keith Ellis mentioned uh, sort of it, uh, sort of the translation uh, it, uh, that he in, uh, encountered in Italy. So similarly, Vittorio Del Duca sort of translated between a lot of the Russian literature for those, those of us uh, more familiar with sort of standard quantum field theory methods and sort of the Russian school, uh, which is more in thinking in terms of dispersion relations and so on. And that's kind of how I really understood Lipato's work in the first place. <laughs> um, now, when you go beyond next to leading log, it turns out that regiization breaks down. Uh, and you find contributions such as 3 g gluon exchange that, that uh, sort of breaks this kind of uh, construction as seen here. Uh, and this is discussed in these papers here. And this is somehow deeply related some of the, to some of the ideas that I'll be uh, discussing here. Now, um, what, so this construction, although very beautiful and elegant, is, is, is flawed. Um, because when you go to, uh, well, when you go to sort of uh, very small x or higher, higher energies, there's uh, the very rapid growth of the BFKL cross section also leads to very large phase space occupancy of gluons. And in the language of, 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 of the twist expansion, uh, what you find is that higher twist contributions uh, corresponding to such kind of corrections to the BFK ladder where you have uh, one Pomeron split into two Pomerons. Um, uh, and these cuts correspond to different kinds of uh, phenomena corresponding. So this would be, for example, a diffractive cut um, corresponding to, say, multiple scattering, for instance. Uh, and then there are such screening cuts that also appear. Uh, and was shown by these authors uh, already um, 30 years ago, uh, more than 30 years ago, almost 40 years ago, uh, that, uh, that such cuts give you um, contributions which are higher twist, 
and they're suppressed by Q squared, but they grow very rapidly with the energy. So at some point, all these higher twist corrections become equally important. Um, and so there's, you sort of enter this new regime where you don't, don't just have sort of harder gluons split to softer and softer gluons, uh, but you have softer gluons kind of recombining to form harder gluons. And as uh, this is a quote from Frank Wilczek, where he says, a fascinating equilibrium of splittings and recombination should eventually result. And it's a considerable theoretical challenge to calculate this equilibrium in, in detail. Um, and I alternately like to call it a death by a million cuts, because as you go to higher and higher twists, you have more and more such cuts to deal with. Uh, and, and at some point, as I mentioned, all these higher twist contributions become equally important. And you can estimate where that is the case, and that's when the phase space occupancy is on the order of one over the coupling. Okay. And this immediately suggests to you that there must be sort of a classical way to think about this physics. Okay. Um, and so let me sort of lead you through this very sort of back of the envelope kind of argument about that. So if you think about two to n scattering at very high energies, so then the probability of this, uh, so where n is very large, so the probability of this would be some, you know, the, the number of microstates that can be written as e to some log, that's the entropy, the number of microstates, times the coupling to power n times n factorial. Now, if n equal to order one or alpha s, and if you ignore this, this entropy factor, you find that there's a suppression. This gives you, just use Sterling's formula, you get e to the minus one or alpha s, of course. So you would think that a configuration corresponding to very high occupancy, a classical configuration, would be highly suppressed unless this has an entropy in on the order of one over alpha. Okay. And that's what we would need to get uh, such a cross section to saturate the unitarity. Um, and you can actually sort of construct a kind of Goldstone picture of this, and, and uh, you find that actually this, this value, you can argue, uh, is something that may satisfy the Bekenstein bound uh, for the entropy. So this is a highly, highly saturated state of, of gluons. Now, within our conventional picture of DGLAP and BFKL, perturbative QCD, one can think of it the following way. So imagine you are very high resolution. So pick a high enough resolution that you feel that you know, perturbative QC is valid, then say you go to higher and higher energies. And at some point, the density of partons, the space space occupancy will become very, very large on the order of one over alpha. Okay? And that's the kind of also, <laughs> this as I argued here, is the unitization boundary. And the physics becomes intrinsically non-perturbative, even though you are at very large Q squareds. Okay, so your coupling can be very, very weak, but the physics becomes intrinsically perturbative. And so, so, so what this tells you is that for every Q squared, there's an X beyond which the physics kind of reaches this unitarized classical regime. Okay. And that tells you there's an emergent scale, which is the Q at every X. So that's Q S of X. Okay. And that can be thought of as a close packing scale Okay, where, which characterizes this non-perturbative physics of these very short distances. Now, if QS is much larger than lambda QCD, then this is a weak coupling scale. So if you just take strict rage asymptotics, do a Gedanken experiment, then this is telling you that this is really beautiful, very weakly coupled physics, which is highly non-perturbative. Okay. And so how do we think about that? Um, now, before I discuss that, uh, I want to argue to you that this really opens a whole window into thinking about a large class of problems, uh, which is true not, so it just takes, it sort of banishes the distinction between protons and nuclei at very high energies and really says these are just playgrounds for many body gluonic physics uh, because at very short distances at very high energies, there's a universality there in terms of these classical lumps. Uh, and, and it explains very simply things that people talk about, like color transparency and color opacity and shadowing and so on, by saying that there is an emergent scale, that's this unitization, classicalization scale, with respect to which, if you're looking at very short distances, then the physics is just, you know, this thing scale with the nuclear size. 
While if you go to the other regime where this scale is much larger than one over Q squared, then, then things are completely screened. The cross section becomes very large. Uh, and so, and, and what I'm going to argue to is that this scale grows with energy. So it gets larger and larger as you go to smaller and smaller x. So this picture becomes better and better. Okay. So this kind of uh, helps you understand a, a large class of phenomena in a con consistent way. Um, and so what is the quantitative or semi-quantitative? I wouldn't be bold enough to say fully quantitative, but you'll see that's where we're going. Um, and this is a bottom-up effective field theory in the, in the language that Ian introduced, where um, it really relies on um, sort of a, a light front construction where you think about very large X modes, sort of st static modes in the light front. So imagine that you have a probe that's scattering of a very fast hadron. And so the large X modes in this hadron essentially living along the light cone, so they're like static modes. Okay. Uh, by the way, so um, Lenny Susskind mentioned this paper he wrote in 1968 where he talked about so, you know, this Galilean sort of formulation of light front. Um, where you can really do this map between heavy quark modes and large X modes in the light front. So, so these large X modes are sort of static modes, but of course they carry color, so you can think of them as constituting a large number of color sources, which are then uh, sort of generate all these soft dynamical gauge fields, which are then what scatter off your probe, which could be, say, a virtual photon splitting into quark anti quark pair, which then sort of begins to resolve this very rich structure. So if you start thinking about this problem in this kind of language, then you see that the large X modes can be thought of as stochastic sources. They are not dynamical in the time scales of the scattering. They're essentially static, light front sources. Um, and they can be represented by some gauge invariant weight functional, which is at some scale separating the very dynamical degrees of freedom down here and the static degrees of freedom up here. And the dynamical degrees of freedom you treat completely generally in QCD with some gauge invariant coupling, uh, which is given by this term here. So there's a gauge invariant coupling sources to fields, uh, which is represented by Wilson line. So actually, it's a log of Wilson line that really comes in. Uh, and then you can compute. You can compute correlation functions and amplitudes systematically. Okay. Now, um, so Larry and McLaren and I kind of had this epiphany that actually it's really ironically for very large nuclei that this construction is most robust because uh, if you think in terms of you know very small x so you have large EOFA times a nucleus provides the largest number of coherent sources that you can you can have uh, in fact that goes as a to the one third and so if you think the limit of an infinitely large nucleus that gives you a scale which is much larger than lambda QCD so this allows you to construct a weak coupling EFT uh, of that, that in the, of, the, the, of the weight functional in the, in the uh, previous slide. And you find that it's just a central limit theorem satisfied by these sources where you can understand Pomerons as, as these, uh, sort of, sort of the, as the, uh, as the Casimir uh, of these, of these uh, static configurations. And then you have the Ardron configuration as the cubic Casimir that you construct this. Uh, and and this, this sounds kind of trivial almost, but it, it sort of explains a lot of things that we see. Now, if you are really thinking about this more formally, what you're really doing is, is Katkowski's rules and strong fields. Okay. Um, so if you, uh, so here's an example that I'm showing you of sort of connected vacuum to vacuum graphs and phi cubed, where you think about, so just following Schwinger and Keldish, you introduce these plus and minus, uh, you know, uh, couplings and, and, and currents uh, on this contour. And then, so the cuts correspond to putting all the pluses on one side and all the minuses on the other side. Um, and so you can sort of really construct quantum field theory fully uh, in, in using this. Uh, and this gives you a very simple understanding of these things which were very mysterious to me when I was trying to delve into the literature, things like AGK cutting rules and region field theory, which I never understood at all. And so it's just really understanding. So this is just the combinatorics uh, of cut and uncut subgraphs, you know, falling Kutkowski, uh, contributing to a given multiplicity. Okay? Um, and it's a very general consequence of unitarity in strong fields. 
And it's completely independent of the language of you know, regions and Pomerans. And so perhaps, uh, throw it out there, that one should rather think about these objects as the simplest constructions which enforce strong field unitarity rather than fundamental objects in, in themselves. Um, and so now what about this, this not classical construction? Um, and so if you ask, you know, what is the saddle point of this lump? Uh, so that's really solving Yang-Mills equations, the presence of these shockwave sources. And it turns out that there's a discontinuity, right? That's a shockwave. Uh, and so all the we partons to first approximation sort of sit on these on the shock waves, which are sourced by the valence degrees of freedom. And, and what you have is these two pure gauges that separate the shock wave. Uh, and so this kind of uh, made me realize that this is very similar to these ideas sort of advocated by Strominger um, and his collaborators, where you can think about the physics of very soft weak partons uh, in the language of asymptotic symmetries, where essentially what you have is, so this BMS-like symmetry in gravity can be thought of as a physics of large gauge transformations, which are broken when you, by the shock wave, by the solution. Uh, and in fact, there's an explicit construction where you can sort of map the transverse dynamics on the shock wave to celestial sphere null infinity. So you can sort of do a stereographic projection uh, of these retarded coordinates and the holomorphic coordinates in the transverse plane to that sort of the usual light cone coordinates. And then you can understand this kind of dipole scattering of this shock wave uh, as this color memory effect, which is the exact analog of the, the gravitational memory effect. And in fact, these Wilson lines that are, provide solutions of the Yang-Mills equations of, uh, represented here uh, are, can be really thought of as vertex operators in the celestial sphere and principles satisfy the conformal katz moody algebra. Now, um, in this construction, as I mentioned, because you have recoupling at EFT, you can, you can solve for all endpoint correlators. Um, and so what you get is, so here's some arbitrary operator, small x. And, and so there's an RG which tells you that if you start at some scale where you had your sources and fields, and now you shifted your cutoff, right? You can, well, you can compute all the x logs, and that gives you a new distribution of sources and fields as you go to smaller and smaller x. And of course, the weak coupling description, as I mentioned, gets better and better as you go to smaller and smaller x. Uh, and so when you saw the, the RG equations can be represented as a hierarchy of such uh, of this uh, uh, is, is represented, this, this, this equation represents a hierarchy of equations for endpoint Wilson line correlators, where, which has the form of a Fokker-Planck equation, but in the functional space of these sources, where the skies are the two-point Green's functions in this background field, which is like a diffusion coefficient. So everyone knows that a Fokker-Planck equation has a Langevin realization. Uh, and so you can really think about this, these n-body correlators as representing the Langevin diffusion of weak partons on this transverse surface. Okay. And this gives this hierarchy of equations is called the Bolitsky jim wilk hierarchy of endpoint Wilson line correlators that was done, work done by here. And we actually solved this to leading log accuracy because it's a Langevin equation, which is a 2D Langevin equation. And so this is shown here. Uh, you can look at correlators of Wilson lines as a function of rapidity, and you see that these blobs in the transverse plane getting smaller and smaller. That's the typical emergent scale that you're seeing, which is smaller and smaller. So, so that's, that's kind of nice to see. Now, as a specific example, if you think about, say, this dipole scattering of the shock wave that I mentioned, which is classical lump, short distances, and so this is separated some spatial position x and y, now, if I now do corrections to this, so I have met a gluon which also scatters the shock wave. So, so the description of this inclusive scattering in the language of Wilson lines is a dipole correlator Wilson lines, one of this which represents the dynamics at the spatial point X, the other at the spatial point Y. And so this is the solution to the first equation of the hierarchy that I showed you in the previous slide, where on the left-hand side you have this dipole and uh, then you return proportional to the dipole. So that's a virtual kind of contribution. 
And then there are real emissions, which give you this kind of double correlator of dipoles, where Z perp is the point of the emitted gluon. Now, if you take a large NC, large nucleus approximation, you can sort of close this hierarchy. And this closed form is something called the nonlinear belsky kopchakov equation. So it's a, it's a nonlinear equation because you have some dipole, dipole squared on the right-hand side. And that describes very nicely this kind of multi on fan diagrams that you have. Um, and um, what you find as a solution of this equation is that there's a non-trivial fixed point to this equation. And that's precisely what defines this emergence scale, which is the saturation scale. And the solution of this equation can be solved numerically. There's no known analytical solution, even though we have approximate solutions. It has this nice kind of uh, soliton-like shape, which, as you go to higher and higher rapidities, moves outward. So essentially, the truly non protoidal physics becomes less and less important as you go to larger and larger scales. So this becomes a truly large scale, which is a weak coupling scale. And the BFKL equation can be understood as nothing but the low density limit of this equation. So if I were to expand out these Wilson line correlators, I will get the BFKL equation. So from this semi-classical construction, we see sort of smooth matching to uh, the sort of the, the classic construction that I mentioned of the part of, uh, very, very simply. Um, and so we can now go much further. We can go to next to leading ord. So there's, of course, been a lot of work since. And as example, I mentioned uh, deep plastic scattering grain, where I look at digests. Uh, where I have back-to-back -back digets with some large PT and some momentum imbalance QT. Uh, and we can now look at factorization of these leading log. Uh, we can go to next to leading log. Actually, sorry, it's strictly next to leading order, sorry. Um, and at next to leading order, you can sort of do factorization between, again, the physics, sorry. Um, I'm going backwards. Um, you see there's a dice factorization uh, between these non perturbative objects that emerge in the radial limit. So these are, in this particular instance, the unpolarized uh, and linear polarized white square Williams distribution. So this is the gluon distribution, the shock wave to next to leading accuracy. But then there's also, of course, the physics that's going on at, at larger axes, uh, and that's, that, that's a pseudocall physics of soft gluon emissions, which are which are fast gluons. So the slow gluons you absorb in, in these, in these non-perturbative objects, which are these white sucker williams distributions. And the soft gluons you can show explicitly are resummed into these Surikov factors, which sum both double and single logs. So now we have a quantitative description, this framework at next to leading order, and we can make predictions of how these behave. Uh, so these are uh, ratios of cross sections. So in a, say, a nucleus uh, to that of a nucleon as a function of the momentum imbalance. Uh, and so these are the leading order expressions you get. Uh, then if you include Sudikov logs as a suppression, and there's even further suppression that comes in and also include the small x evolution. So these actually obey nonlinear RG equations which are kinematically constrained. Uh, and this, this plot here reflects the solutions which show you a suppression of these cross sections. You can also study them as a function of A. So the nucleus is no longer some mysterious disconnected object. It's very much part of the game. And so you can study all of this functions of you know, A and try to uncover this kind of non-trivial physics. Uh, and so you can also then do global analyses between PA and, a, and, and, and EA, for example. Uh, and they will have EA collisions to the EIC. And there's a very large number of inclusive, semi-inclusive, exclusive, diffractive final states, which one can try and compute quantitatively in this approach. And so there's a, there's a huge program uh, which goes back to the original papers uh, by Fadim Dapadov, uh, also Kamichi and Ciappoloni, uh, and many, many others. Uh, there's very important contributions as Salam, uh, and then there's you know, computations of impact factors at NLO for a large number of processes. And this year, year alone, there were sort of 20 odd papers kind of uh, working on this. And so of course the push is then to go to next to next leading order. It's very, very hard to do that. And there's some preliminary work by Simone Karn-Hewitt, which you mentioned, which sort of goes in that direction. 
Uh, and so there's, so this is a state of the art. Um, so you can actually, you know, at next to leading order, uh, next to leading log, you can actually compute single includes hadron distribution of LHC as shown here for different rapidities. You can look at structure functions at HERA. Uh, and so we actually have now a DOE topical theory collaboration which a large number of people sort of trying to push both on the theory and phenomenological aspects of this. Um, how am I doing in terms, I have a little bit of time. Yeah, yeah, okay. So, so, I, uh, so, so, so these semi-classical approaches are extremely powerful in addressing questions which we would otherwise not be amenable to quantitative analysis. If you think about trying to compute an AA collision using amplitudes, that'd be extremely hard. Um, and so in this picture, uh, you have shock wave collisions of gluons at very high energies. Okay? So it's semi-classical. And you can actually do quantum fluctuations around these semi-classical distributions uh, and study its space-time evolution. Um, and what you find is the emergence of very non-trivial phenomena like non-thermal attractors. So you have turbulent attractors and so on, which I unfortunately don't have a lot of time to go into, but it's a, it's, it's a, it's a, it's a lot of very interesting physics. And there's also hydrodynamic attractors which then leads to the formation of a quark gluon plasma, and you're going to hear a lot more about that in, in Barbara's talk later today. Um, so just if you're interested, I want to mention there's a, just again, self-promotion here, there's a, there's a review of modern physics I wrote with collaborators which discusses all these, these rich dynamics. Uh, and that's illustrated kind of in this one plot here, is that you start from a phenomenon which is very far from the equilibrium, shock waves. There's a kind of scrambling and memory loss that happens uh, very similar to what people talk in the, la in the physics of black holes. And the system there flows to a non-thermal fixed point, which is self-similar, but cools. And eventually, the occupancies go below one, and then you really have uh, a, qu a quantum kinetic description that can be used, and you can follow the system all the way to thermal equilibrium, which is remarkable. Okay? And there's a very beautiful paper by someone in this room, Damson, Al Mueller, and collaborators, where they actually were able to calculate this process. And this is, of course, at very asymptotic values of QS, where you have weak coupling. And what you find is that you, the system thermalizes. You get a heat bath uh, at a time which is characterized by 1 over QS times this funny power of alpha S. And you can compute the thermalization temperature. Uh, and at very large QS, the temperature is very large. So essentially, you construct, you're forming a, de a deconfined system. Uh, and now people look at this formula and they say, oh, this thermalization time is very large because you have one over alpha. However, one has to keep in mind, as David and, and Frank and, and Paul Sir taught us, that this runs as a function of QS. So no power can beat a one over QS, so you have very rapid thermalization. So as you go to the strict regi limit, the system thermalizes almost instantaneously. And so all these debates about, well, can you, how small can a system be? Can you have you know, high dynamic flow? In principle, uh, there's no problem with that. Um, so if, as long as, this, as the size of your lump is much smaller than the radius of the object that's colliding, you can have such phenomena. And that, I believe, is what fundamentally explains a lot of the physics that we're seeing in small systems at, at, at RIC and the LHC. So um, in the last... Uh, minutes that I have, I want to switch to, uh, I alluded briefly to some connections to gravity where you could think in terms of, you know, 2 to n scattering. Uh, and of course, there's a celebrated double copy, which is uh, due to Zui and, and, and uh, his friends, which, uh, which I believe you'll hear talk about from David, uh, is the remarkable connections between perturbative QCD and perturbative gravity that have emerged. Um, really beautiful work. Uh, and my interest in this was jogged by a talk I heard by Walter Goldberger uh, and, and uh, on sort of a possible sort of classical double copy where you can map QCD at high occupancies to gravity at high occupancies. Now, I went through the, the earlier parts of my talk arguing to you that one has a CFP construction QCD using strong field techniques, uh, which are very powerful, and they provide an alternative to amplitudes approaches in certain kinematic regions, and uh, that there are G equations which allow you to compute and match onto the 
the full theory in, in specific limits. And the question is, can we do the same thing for gravity in the strong field regime of transplanking and scattering? So can we compute gravitational wave radiation with varying frequency and impact parameter to extract the quantum features of general relativity and to obtain insight, at least into the beginnings of black hole formation. And this is a program that Gabriele here and Marcello Cefaloni and Amati, of course, have been uh, pursuing for a very long time. And this is uh, just a complementary way of thinking about it. And the complementary aspect, again, goes back to Lepato. So what Lepato noticed in a paper from 1982 was actually a double copy between QCD amplitudes and gravity amplitudes in the radio limit. Um, and uh, in fact, he just he looked at the same problem, two, in, two to n scattering and gravity. And he constructed the Lepato vertex in gravity. And he constructed you know, the radioized graviton propagator in gravity. Uh, in this thing, and, and he showed that there's a remarkable double copy. So that's the Lepato double copy. So that's actually in his 1982 paper. Um, I, this is not working, I guess. Where you see the, the gravitational Lepato vertex is a bilinear of the QCD Lepato vertex that I, I mentioned earlier. And interestingly, minus a bilinear of the QED Bramstrahlen vertex. And so if you look at Lepato's paper, uh, and it's obscure, even though it was referenced to by, by Suskin in his paper on the famous paper on the hologram, you know, thinking of we partons. Um, and you, it, the paper is very hard to read. And as I said, I needed Del Duca to sort of do the translation of that. But, um, but you can actually derive this from Einstein's equations. Again, the semi-classical approach. And this is something that I was able to show very recently with uh, Himanshu Raj postdoc of mine, which actually should be Raj, not Raju. <laughs> just, it's my first name. Uh, and uh, and in just an exact analogy to, sorry, what we did in the QCD case. So in QCD, you can also derive the Lepato vertex from shockwave collisions. That was demonstrated by us a long time ago. And you can also do it in, in gravity. Um, and it has exactly in analogous form. So what do you do is you solve Einstein's equations for linearized perturbations around a sh sort of shockwave metric in a regime where the Schwarzschild radius is smaller than the impact parameter, of course. Um, and then you can sort of demonstrate explicitly that, that the radiation amplitude can be written in this form. Here, these were the sources that I had in QCD, the color sources. These are now just mass densities at some impact parameter. Uh, with a vertex, which is this gravitational Lepatov vertex, and it's exactly this result that Lepatov had. Okay? Uh, and so that's very, very uh, exciting to me, at least. Um, and and uh, this sort of suggests itself for a whole program in trying to see if we can now develop this kind of RG approach where you now start to build the elements of the 2 to n ladder. So what one has to compute shockwave propagators and such background fields and go through the whole construction. So to conclude, uh, there's been significant progress in understanding real-time dynamics in QCD's rigid limits. Uh, there are still outstanding fundamental problems. I have sort of shoved them under the carpet a bit. Um, and um, in particular, we want to understand large couplings. And I'm thinking maybe this is a way for us to sort of go there. Um, Rather than just thinking in terms of amplitudes and BFKLs, or sort of start from semi-classical, saying, you know, you have strong fields of weak coupling. How do you make the transition to large couplings? Uh, there are rich interdisciplinary connections, as I alluded to briefly to heavy ions. I didn't talk about cold atoms, but there are some very, very interesting sort of universal connections. And then I just mentioned GR. The other interesting phenomenon I didn't have to, time to discuss is actually uh, work that was motivated again by Gabriele in thinking about the quenching of the proton spin at that small x. Uh, and there may be sort of possible ways to uncover evidence for sphalerin like transitions. Uh, and that can be straightforwardly ruled in or out at the electron ion collider. If you're interested, you can look at this paper here. So thank you very much for your time. Thank you, Rajo. Uh, uh, okay, thanks. Um, you know, I, I reacted to your 
comment, uh, part of when you mentioned this um, uh, breaking of operator product suspension. And I think that uh, uh, such expression should not exist. Uh, operator product expansion never breaks. <laughs> uh, uh, well, uh, well, okay. it, no, I, what, what I mean, I, what I, what I mean is that. No, no, that, I understood yeah. what you mean. No, no, I, it's not that uh, I, I understood, it, but I'm trying just to make clear that it's partly refers actually to Jan to your talk, but I was not able to make a man. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so <laughs> I'm I'm donating my time no, no, again. No, no, no. <laughs> no what 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 the, the part which yeah, I'm trying yeah, to emphasize, yeah, yeah. and I believe was not completely imprecise uh, by by Jan, was that. Uh, you you uh, uh, going uh, from uh, short distances to uh, uh, to large distances, so it's in this way top bottom, top top down uh, approximation. Okay, because no, we believe that we have uh, uh, the reason is simple, right? That we have asymptotically free series, right? But uh, and when you write in this uh, operator product expansion, you have this uh, operator coefficient and operators, and uh, uh, and its crucial point is to inter uh, is introduction normalization point which divided this uh, infrared and uh, ultraviolet, and it uh, could be sub subtle uh, stuff, uh, you know. Uh, so when you see the effect like you are discussing, what does it mean? It means that uh, you start from short distances where you believe it. I mean, where you can put uh, uh, this coefficient to run, uh, and you are counting this short distance, and it's completely within approximation. Then, uh, when you are reaching the point where, uh, you know, kind of, uh, this, uh, this, you are reaching kind of large distances, then then you cannot go further. You, you should say, aha, it's, it's matrix element of operator. You, can, uh, you, you cannot calculate it in the, at least in the weak coupling regime, right? Uh, I, I, and, uh, and I believe that this point should be emphasized, you know, that, that in this sense, uh, you, you, uh, because you wrote expression, mu was not there. I mean, it was kind of hidden it, it, in it, alpha, right? No, there's, 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 there's a mu there, which I, I didn't get to emphasize. No, no. Right, uh, but yeah. no, no, no. Uh, but, there's but actually I mean, two mu's there. <laughs> right, but but in yeah. this way, it yeah. would tell you yeah. uh, that you reach the scale where you know s something going on. And, yes, and yes. Then you would call yes. it matrix of operator. Then yeah. it would yes. be dynamics which is not calculable in this way. Okay, I'm sorry. That's it. I mean, yeah. So yeah. So so there's actually two mu's. One is in Q squared. So these are so so when you go to high energies, there's a physics of soft gluons, and there's a physics of slow gluons. And so what I'm talking about is separating physics of slow gluons from fast gluons. And then there's soft. There's, well, but so then you get an RG, but you have to be careful in keeping yeah. track of both. And that's all I'm saying. Right, yeah, but yeah, but yeah, 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 yeah. Yes. Yeah, no, it's, it, but the, high, the, the terms and the naive yeah. the high twist terms become important. Yeah. 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 OK, thank you for the nice talk. Um, you know, I have been trying to understand unsuccessfully the relation between the grip of uh, the the Lipatov approach of the BF BFKL approach and what I presented in my talk, namely this uh, topological expansion of QCD. So, I was wondering whether you have any insight on on this. In other words, if I do a bona fide large N expansion in QCD. Can I associate terms of that expansion with what you presented in some systematic way? One thing that shocks me, but perhaps I know the answer to that, is that you are only drawing gluons, but of course at LHC we see mostly QQ bar mesons in the final state. Oh, so uh, I guess the quark loops are just part of the adronization. No, 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 it's, it's and you it's, simply it's, neglect it's, them. It's, it's a subleading correction that comes to next to leading log. In what? It's it, next to leading log in X. So 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 at leading log, right? So as this is Lepato's so it's exactly the same thing in the Lepato construction of BFKL, right? Leading log is the two to n gluon ladder. Okay. At next to leading log, you, you get the quarks come in, which contribute to the next to leading log. Uh, BFK. You mean in the, yeah. I mean C quark, C quark. Yes, yeah. you have C quarks. I mean C quarks. Yeah. I mean C quarks. So you have C quark loops that come in at next to leading log. In X. Yeah, in X. Okay. And so so it's so that's part of the next to leading log resummation. Okay, but certainly they yeah. dominate 
in, uh, in the <laughs> in the physics, right? Well, I mean, the quark loops are important the quark because, loops are, the because quark otherwise, when you cut through your pomeron, you don't see mesons; you see glue balls, and glue balls are only produced mm -hmm. to to the subleading order in one over n. Well, but uh, yeah, so I, I'm I'm really still working sort of in weak coupling, where I'm really thinking about these gluons and then fragments to. To QQ bars. That's what hard. I mean. So, so, uh, so, so, so there's a there's a physics. So what I'm saying is everything that I'm talking about is a prelude to going to Thorbjorn and saying, okay. okay, now I have to understand the yeah. physics of fragmentation. Yeah, that's and, what and I'm that, saying. That uh, is a, yeah. is a completely much harder problem uh, that I'm not addressing. But in uh, here, no. okay, yeah. so that, yeah. that yeah. I think uh, yeah. I agree. Yeah. But yeah. in the, yeah. in terms yeah. of of yeah. classifying. Yeah. For instance, uh, pom uh, pomeron poles, pomeron triple vertex, uh, cuts or Gribov's region calculus. Uh, do you see it emerging y from, yes, yes. from this in a systematic? Yes, way? yes. And so, so, but I have to say that I've spent a lot of time trying to think about the question you asked, which is, you know, trying to understand this in terms of your topological construction and I hope that's where we can go to really kind of push it down to that's the trying to go to large couplings and, and how that emerges but I'm but people try to think about it and kind of trying to go from BFKL I'm saying you should approach it from the strong field uh, kind of perspective but I think that's where I, I would like to go personally is to 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 to, to address what you discussed in your 1976 paper <laughs> Yeah. 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 Yeah.